here in Canada, more than 8,000 people a month were going on Google, searching the phrase, how to kill yourself. And the top search result was seven easy, painless ways to kill yourself. 20,000 people a month are searching for how to meet up with a prostitute. So I stand in front of everyone. I'm like, this is one of the most insane things I've ever heard of, but I have no idea what to do about it. I remember it was like this dark room. I was upstairs studying. There's just like one light over my shoulder. My, my father, he comes and he puts this big Bible on the table, like slaps it down and he goes, read this verse for the next hour. And I want you to pray over it. And I want you to think about it. And I want you to ask God to communicate to you. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then I look at it, it says, wide is the gate, large is the road that leads to destruction and many will go that route. Small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only few will go through it. Man, I had just a battle, a battle that night with God. I was 13 at the time, I was starting to go to all the cool parties. There was this intrinsic desire in me to follow the crowds. The passage says that leads to destruction. And I was like, well, I want life. I don't want destruction. That same year when I was 13, that's when I got baptized. I got baptized in front of my whole church, dunked in water, publicly saying, man, I'm gonna follow Jesus. I got the Jesus fish bracelet, cause I was like, this is go time. I'm going the narrow road, step one, Jesus bracelet. I would, I would go around and I would just put my hand on tables. <laughs> I was like, that's probably the best way to share my faith is like put my hand on tables and let them see the, the Jesus fish. I would actually like share my faith and I would see my friends like meet Jesus and turn their life around. And it was like a really strong season of my life throughout high school. So my father went to university for business. My older brother went to the same university for business. My older sister went to the same university for business. So I went to the other side of the country, <laughs> but I stayed in business so they didn't kick me out of the family. I was just about to graduate and I was just really wrestling with where, where does the Lord want me to go? This one guy sat down, he's like this uh, business leader. And I'm telling him my story, what I'm struggling with, what I'm thinking about, where I feel God's calling me. He goes, okay, hold on. He gives me this blank piece of paper and he goes, say I was someone that you didn't know much about. You just had this blank piece of paper and a pen. What would you write on it? And I was like, oh, is that a business idea, a startup idea, a tech company? And then I was like, oh man, I'll just share that Jesus forgives you and that you're enough. And he's like, well, maybe that's what you should do with your life. I couldn't get it out of me, this idea of, I want people to see Jesus and change very, very deeply. I was listening to a message on what you're called to. This guy says, you know you're called to something when you can't get it out of you. I was like, okay, I'm going into like full-time ministry. I don't know what that means. And so I actually looked around and I ended up applying to do a Masters of Divinity I went and I worked at a church as a ministry intern for three years. It's a very proud title, uh, ministry intern, you know, big money. But it was actually in the midst of all that, that my wife and I decided we would take three months and live in South Sudan. And so we pack up, spend three months living in one of the poor places in the entire world. What we discovered was that we don't want to do parachute charity with our life. And parachute charity is essentially you live in a super safe neighborhood. You go into a poor neighborhood for two hours, do some good deeds, leave and you go, I expect everything to change. And so when we came back from South Sudan, my wife and I, along with 18 other people, moved into this neighborhood that people were trying to get out of. And you know, we spent the next three years journeying with our friends through suicide attempts to, we had one person shot and killed, you know, in our neighborhood. And then I get to this conference. There's this guy preaching. He says this phrase that literally was this shift in my life. He said, in the midst of devastation, there's an opportunity for innovation. 
The devastation was everything we were experiencing in our neighborhood. In the midst of that dark brokenness, there's an opportunity for new things. I got to figure out what that means for my life. And so then I went on this journey where I asked everybody I knew, what does that mean? You know, I was like, I can't get it out of my head. That's when I started meeting a lot of tech people. They would say this phrase to me a lot. I don't know my place in the church. Or one guy said to me, I don't want to do public speaking and I don't play acoustic guitar. What do I do in the church? It's all you got. And then I was like, well, what do you do now? He's like, PowerPoint. And then I find out later, he's one of the foundational members of creating text messaging. I'm sitting across from one of the smartest guys I've ever met in my life. And the guy's running PowerPoint. And I'm like, look, you gotta have the PowerPoint guy, but I'm that guy. And I said to him, can you build some sort of global platform that all the missionaries around the world could share their resources? Could you build that? And he looks up in the sky. I kid you not, for like a minute and a half. He's just like looking up. And I'm like, I'm looking up. I'm like, what the, what's this guy looking at, you know? I think he was building the, the platform in the sky at the coffee shop. And then he looks down and he goes, yeah, I could build that. And I'm like, well, why don't you? He goes, no one's ever told me that's a way that I could use my gifts and abilities. And then I met all these pastors and ministry leaders that were really struggling with thinking about technology. A lot of pastors came to me and said, one of the leading issues I have right now is digital addiction or screen addiction. And so there's just like these two struggling camps. Eventually I was like, hey guys, let's all get in a room together. So I reserved the corner of this coffee shop and then 35 people show up. It was one of the most electrifying nights of my life. I thought we were gonna start like 10 companies such an eclectic group of tech people, of pastors, ministry leaders, and business leaders. And they all show up and we put them all at tables together. The, the ministry folks would say, here's a problem and I don't know how to solve it. The tech person goes, so let me help you figure out a solution for that. And the business person's like, okay, what do you need? Let's make this happen. It was unbelievable. And then a couple months later, we did another one of those gatherings. And then we did a TED talk style event and 163 people show up. I can't believe there's this much interest around the intersection of faith and technology. And then we did a hackathon. Now, if you don't know what a hackathon is, it's one of the coolest things on earth. It's like a retreat for geeks. For our hackathons, you take a really big problem and in one very short amount of time, you have to come up with a solution, pitch it to a panel of judges and we award winners and some of the most crazy things started happening. I had found out weeks before this hackathon that here in Canada, more than 8,000 people a month were going on Google, searching the phrase, how to kill yourself. And the top search result was seven easy, painless ways to kill yourself that showed you how to do it. So I stand in front of everyone. I'm like, this is one of the most insane things I've ever heard of, but I have no idea what to do about it. So this team gets together they buy the domain howtokillyourself.org. But when you go on their website, rather than like seven easy panels ways to kill yourself, it's three words, you're not alone. And there's information, there's a phone number to call. Rather than searching for destruction, they find hope. And they win the hackathon, amazing. Fast forward a year on that story, and one of the ladies on the team, she's like, last night I was out for coffee with my friend. And I started describing the website to her. And the friend interrupts her. She grabs her arm, she goes, what is the domain of that website? And she goes, howtokillyourself.org. Just wept. The night before, she went online to figure out how to kill herself. And she said, I landed on that website and that site saved my life. I'm looking around going, did anyone know we could build a website that could literally save people's lives? We had a one-year-old son at the time, and the Lord's like, yep, that's about the time you quit your job. And I went around to everybody I knew, and I said, I need to do this full time. And then the Lord started slowly gathering this group of people around us who said, we're gonna help fund you starting an organization we called Faith Tech. And then from there, it got even crazier. I had friends in major cities that were like, hey, point us to 
a group like Faith Tech in our cities. And so I just make some calls and found out nothing like it existed. The year after we had started in our small town of Waterloo, we started gathering some people in Toronto, started gathering some people in Vancouver. We said, hey, let's wrestle through the same things together. And then they started doing hackathons and they started seeing their stories come about. Then people in Chicago and Silicon Valley are like, how do we get connected with what you're doing? So now Faith Tech has become this movement beyond an organization, a community of people that are starting to recognize the opportunity that we have to use the gifts and abilities of a group that have felt lost and disconnected from the church to help change the world. This is powerful. Facebook wants you to be more connected with more people. Well, if everyone feels really greatly connected, why is everyone still suffering with deep depression? And why are people turning to suicide at rates higher than ever before? And why are we on our cell phones for an average of five hours a day? There's a strange paradox going on right now. And this is why we need to step into that conversation and recognize the great opportunity that exists. The advantage around technology is that we understand how it can change and influence people. And the choice is, will I let it consume me and lead down a path of destruction? Or will I see it as a tool that I can use in order to change the lives of my friends? The Bible says, throw off everything that hinders that doesn't help you run with Jesus. That doesn't make you more like Jesus. Everything's drawing for our attention, consuming our time and consuming our energy. So when I go online, the question is, does that make me more like Jesus? Does going on Facebook make me more like Jesus? The narrow road leads to life and it's worth it. The Christian life is worth it when you make those sacrifices. Despite the destruction that is around us or in us. There's innovation in the midst of that. There's opportunity in the midst of that. What path do I want to follow? The goal of life is joy and beauty and understanding your purpose and why you exist and giving back to life and carrying a load and doing something with the life you've been given. That's foundationally what I'm called to do in this life is listen to where God calls me and am I faithful to him and can I serve him and serve others? Hey, I'm James and you are watching This Is Me TV.